Okay, good morning, everyone. I think we can uh, start. Our fourth and, and uh, plenary talk will be given this morning by Michael Levin. Michael Levin is um, a professor of biology and biomedical engineering at Tufts University in the US. Like many of you, perhaps, I uh, first got to know of Michael's work through his papers on the Xenobots, a very interesting uh, collaboration with jo Josh uh, Bongard. But it was actually after I managed to catch his interview in uh, Lex Fritzman's uh, podcast that I really became very intrigued on the possibilities of, of, of his work. Uh, Michael is a very accomplished academic. Uh, he has the Vannevar Bush Distinguished Professorship. And he is the founding director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts and the co-director of the Institute for Computer Des Design Robotics. His work is at the intersection of development, developmental biophysics, cognitive science, and computer science. I am very excited about this talk. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome Michael. Michael, Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to share some ideas with you today. Um, I appreciate the uh, invitation. Um, uh, I will uh, uh, try a completely new way of giving this talk today. So uh, let's see how it goes. This is uh, this is a very different uh, way to tell these stories than I've ever done in the past. And uh, it goes along with uh, John Searle's comment that uh, you have to allow yourself to be astounded by things that any sane person takes for granted. And we're gonna go over some of these things today. I want to start by uh, asking uh, what this is. So, so this is a uh, it's a small biological that uh, seems to traverse an aqueous path. So this is filled with water. It uh, moves down the path on its own. It uh, you'll see here. So it's uh, it's it's completely self uh, self driven. It moves down the path. It takes the corner without bumping into the opposite wall. So it takes this corner and then spontaneously it turns around and goes back where it came from. So what is, what is this? Well, one thing you might think uh, is that this is a kind of a ciliated organism that uh, you might have found in a pond somewhere and it would have an invertebrate genome. And that's definitely not correct. Uh, you might say that it's a xenobot. This is a biological proto-organism and a kind of uh, biorobotics platform that's made of frog epidermal cells. And this is true. You might also say that uh, this is a vehicle for exploring anatomical morphospace and actually a visualization tool for a kind of diverse intelligence research. And I think that would be deeper and, and closer to the truth. But today I'm going to talk about another way of thinking about this, which is that it's just one part of a, a very heterogeneous composite entity, which consists of biological cells, uh, artificial intelligence in a computer, and also for human scientists. And so in order to try to uh, uh, understand this kind of composite entity, I want to first show you a few uh, unconventional examples of biology. And we're going to talk about a kind of multi-scale competency architecture, which is related to a concept of polycomputing that uh, Josh Bongard and I have been working on. Um, I'm going to show you that functionality in living systems is often cryptic, and it's often hidden by reliable, robust outcomes, and it has to be uncovered. Um, I'm going to tell you that in biology, every part is constantly hacking all of the other parts. And I'll show you some examples of this. And we'll talk about plasticity, we'll talk about uh, virtualization, and we'll talk about using a sort of uh, hardware software lens to understand what these biological systems are doing. The first thing I wanna point out is that um, while we're very comfortable detecting intelligence of medium-sized objects uh, moving at medium speeds in three-dimensional space, such as birds, primates, and so on, uh, Biological intelligence actually exists in many diverse spaces that are very hard for us to recognize. So, for example, living systems routinely solve problems in navigating gene expression spaces, in navigating the state of uh, physiological, um, the space of physiological states, and also the space of possible uh, anatomical configurations or anatomical morphospace. And there are some, some remarkable examples of which I'll only have time to show you a few of, of uh, problem solving in, in all of these spaces. One of the things that we want to talk about is how organisms hack each other or control each other's behavior. So you've probably all heard of this zombie ant fungus, which uh, infects these ants and causes them to do a certain behavior, which is to crawl up on these leaves and freeze and later be eaten. There's another uh, parasite, which has this kind of quite complex um, life cycle where it spends part of its time uh, in, in certain animals, part of its time in other animals that eat uh, the, the, the former animals and so on. And one of the things that this uh, parasite does 
in order to uh, make sure that the host gets eaten by uh, by the next uh, by the next um, by the next one is that it reduces its risk aversion. So if it finds itself uh, in a uh, in a rodent, for example, uh, these rodents will lose fear of cats and they will uh, come out in the open. They'll get eaten by the cat and the parasite um, goes there. So what happens in humans uh, who spend time hanging out with cats when they get infected is that it makes you more entrepreneurial and it also makes you drive your motorcycle too fast for conditions. Basically, what it does is it uh, it lowers risk aversion and um, it's been found that uh, that 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 people who uh, who who uh, have uh, crashes, for example, motorcycle crashes, also uh, various captains of industry and things like this tend to have high rates of being infected by this parasite. It, it literally hacks high level um, behaviors. And what's interesting is that uh, in order to understand this creature, it is not enough to just study the creature itself. You really have to understand the whole cycle. You have to understand what else it's doing, what is um, what is affecting uh, the creature's behavior, and it might be an entirely different living organism and so on. And so, so this 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 theme that that it's not enough to just look at the organism to understand what it's doing either here or here. You have to understand uh, all of the aspects of its environment, some of which are agential organisms themselves. Um, and not only do creatures hack each other's policies for navigating three dimensional space of, of conventional behavior, but they also do it in anatomical and physiological spaces. So here, for example, and this is not Photoshop. This is real. Um, uh, there's this uh, there's this insect called uh, Gonyarella tridens. And what it has is uh, it has an image of ants on its wings. And when threatened, it flaps its wings in a particular pattern that looks to predators as uh, ants scurrying around and, and then nobody wants to mess with these ants. And so it, uh, it, it uses them to scare off, uh, scare off predators. Um, now, this is, this is fairly remarkable. Uh, these, this, this, this creature is, is running a kind of um, stripped down morphogenetic program, a, a, a sort of, uh, uh, Two two dimensional uh, low low resolution morphogenetic program of of these ant shapes, and and it's pretty amazing. The first time I saw this, I was I was just uh, floored, until I I realized that yes, this is amazing. But of course, not more so than the actual fly anatomy. The fact that these cells, yes, these cells can make something that looks like this, but even more impressively, they actually make something that's that looks like this. This is a much more the, the actual host is a much more complex uh, creature. But this is a kind of this is a kind of virtualization. These cells are able to make various different shapes. Now, we are we are generally not um, drawn to these kind of uh, ideas because we think of reliable uh, development. Development is very reliable and robust. After all, uh, acorns always give rise to oak trees, and we think that uh, th th this this sort of thing is what a genome does. It 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 makes um, the the uh, the oak uh, genome that comes from the acorn is able to make this nice flat green structure. But what you might never guess is that actually it can also make these kind of structures. These structures, which are called galls, uh, are made of the plant cells themselves. They are induced uh, by a parasite, in this case, a particular wasp, hacking these plant cells, releasing certain signals that get these cells to build this kind of very unconventional structure. So by looking at something like this, you would actually have no idea. I mean, this is incredibly reliable and robust. You would actually have no idea that these cells are in fact capable of making something completely different. Instead of a flat green leaf, they make this round, spiky, colorful uh, structure. There's a very wide range of these uh, of these gall structures. Um, and so what we're, we're, we're getting is, is, is a, a couple of concepts. One uh, being that um, these uh, these, these cells are actually capable of, of much more uh, diversity than what they normally do when they're impacted by other agents. And, uh, and the other thing is that, is that uh, be because of this, you really have to understand more broadly um, the, uh, the, the, the outer world in which these things live in order to understand what they are capable of. And so we can ask ourselves, is the, we, we look at this frog and it has a certain kind of body and it has a certain kind of uh, uh, cognitive structure with behavior. And so we say, okay, here is the organism. This frog is an organism. But I, I'm going to argue that we think this is an organism because we have really fairly tiny spatiotemporal portals through which we see the world. We don't see the whole evolutionary cycle. Uh, and I think that something like a Xenobot is an amazing device that collapses this much bigger picture into a scale that we can actually appreciate. So whereas uh, this is kind of the simplistic view, what really is an organism is uh, the physical body, but also 
the, its relationships with various uh, aspects of the environment, uh, all of the affordances, which, which may be high or low agency. So there may be other creatures ranging from scientists to, to, uh, to microbes that are there to manipulate this thing. There are uh, physical chemical features of the environment. There's an evolutionary cycle that's wrapped around all of this. There are parasites, there are exploiters, there are conspecifics. All of this is actually what we need to understand to understand this organism, because we need to know what all of these things can do and how the um, how the hardware responds to this uh, in order to be able to predict, control, understand, uh, really uh, rebuild um, and 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 create and relate to these kind of complex structures. So um, as we think about a Zenobot, then this is the story I want to tell in the first half of the, of the talk. What really is a Zenobot? What does the expanded ecology of the Zenobot really look like? So, so what is a Zenobot? Well, um, this is um, this is a project done in collaboration with Josh Bongard's lab. Um, as you'll see, uh, uh, the uh, the other people involved are, are Douglas Blackiston, who's a uh, scientist in, in my group, and uh, Sam Kriegman, who did all the programming. Doug did all the biology. So what we decided to do was to ask this question of uh, what would uh, uh, somatic cells, so so perfectly normal, genetically normal cells, do in the in a different context? Would they be able to reboot their multicellularity? So this is the embryo of the frog Xenopus lavis. Uh, in about eight hours, the cross section looks like this. These um, cells up here are fated to be uh, epidermal or skin cells. Um, so what Doug does is uh, take off these cells, dissociate them, and put them in a in a in a separate environment away from all these other cells. Now, what they they could have done many things. They could have died. They could have spread out and moved away from each other. Uh, they could have made a two dimensional monolayer like cell culture. Instead, this is what they do. Uh, when you dissociate the cells and plate them in this little hole overnight, they uh, coalesce together like this, and they make this uh, they make this round uh, little structure. And uh, what this what the structure does is it begins to swim because it has little hairs. The skin, uh, uh, tadpole skin has little hairs called cilia on it. The hairs rotate and the normal function is to uh, move the mucus down the body of the frog to keep the pathogens and everything else sort of fl flowing away and, and preventing it from grabbing hold. But in this configuration, what it can do is use those same cilia. It can repurpose that hardware uh, for a different uh, for a different uh, different uh, functionality. It can, it can use them to swim. And so what you can see here is, uh, uh, what you can see here is um, a single a single one swimming. Here is uh, some uh, some collective behavior. Uh, this one is kind of going on a long journey. Some of them are doing nothing, just sitting there. These are these two are um, are interacting with each other, and uh, there's all kinds of uh, shapes that you can make. Um, here, Doug Doug made this uh, this this donut kind of shape, which swims along. There are others that have uh, that have this kind of motion. This one was made by uh, Pi in my group, and. Um, they have all sorts of different shapes and motions. Remember, this is just skin. There's uh, there's there's nothing there in f other than uh, skin cells. In fact, if you do some calcium imaging, this is the same kind of imaging that one would do on a brain uh, for um, uh, looking at the, the physiological activity of signaling in, in brains. Uh, what you'll see in these xenobots is uh, something uh, kind of similar. You see lots of lots of activity, and of course, you can imagine all of the tools of information theory being applied to ask. How much integration is there within the bot? How much communication might there be between bots and so on? Actually, the cognitive capacities are um, being studied now, so I'm not going to talk much about that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We have all kinds of uh, experiments on asking what can they learn? What do they sense? What are their preferences? All, all of that is to come. Um, they can also regenerate after damage. So if you cut them almost in half, look at, look at this uh, basically right here. Look at that hinge and how much force uh, it takes to, to squeeze the whole thing through that 180 degree hinge back up into the, into the new Xenobot shape. But one of the, so, so they have many really unexpected behaviors for, for, uh, for a bunch of skin cells, but one of the most amazing behaviors was discovered by AI. So what uh, Josh's lab um, did was to create a simulation environment where they could test out different uh, shapes of these bots and uh, different activities, and uh, also look at what the predicted um, uh, kind of uh, behaviors would be if they were put in an environment where there was loose material in the vicinity. Now, this material can be uh, loose, uh, can be passive particles such as this, or it can be other cells. And if you provide them with cells, it turns out that what happens is that they basically implement 
von Neumann's dream of a robot that goes around and builds copies of itself from materials it finds in the environment. So these, these white, uh, white um, you know, flecks here are individual cells. And what the bots do is they run around and they collect uh, the, the, the material into little piles. They sort of, um, by both collectively and individually, they, they shape the, pile, the, the cells into, into smooth little piles. And because they're working within a gentle material, meaning these are cells that actually have competencies and uh, uh, tendencies for certain kinds of behaviors, what ends up happening is that these, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, kind of uh, balls that they make mature into the next generation of xenobots. So you have the first generation, the second, the third, and so on. And uh, now what you'll notice is that the first one has this interesting Pac-Man shape. What the, what the AI uh, discovered through simulated evolution is that this kind of shape would be very efficient at building these, uh, building these things. And so Doug was able to actually make them. And so you can see them, uh, you can see them here. And so uh, much like us uh, as, as bioengineers, the reason this worked in the first place is because we are working with an agential material. These cells, they're not passive, uh, they're not passive particles. And so I'd like to uh, propose the idea that what the Xenobot really is, is not just this thing. The Xenobot is actually all of this. There are, there are multiple components to, to what actually makes up a Xenobot. It's a composite system consisting of uh, Doug, who um, uh, physically manipulates, uh, manipulates the cells, uh, and, uh, and myself, and, uh, and Josh, and Sam, who uh, implement the uh, evolutionary cycle set up the uh, the particular environment that allows this thing to explore morphous space, the space of possible anatomical and behavioral configurations, and do things that these skin cells otherwise would never do. The cells, of course, themselves have an evolutionary history uh, down to our last common ancestor, but the uh, the proto organism that they make is uh, is completely different than what normally happens. And so there's this there's this composite entity of the AI that actually did the evolutionary simulations to figure out what the manipulations should be, right, to get the cells to do this. And then the, the other features of the environment, so basically the four of us are features of the Xenobot's environment that are hacking it in exactly the same way that I showed you the other biology uh, hacks uh, each other. And, and one of the key uh, parts of this is that we are not hacking it by putting in um, any kind of synthetic biology circuits. There is no genetic change here. There are no novel, uh, novel transcriptional uh, circuits. There's no nanomaterials. What we're doing is providing signals that take advantage of the competencies of the creature, just like in those galls that I showed you and in, and in the various other examples. Now, th this, this here is a really strange kind of entity. This is a sort of distributed uh, being that consists of um, kind of uh, biological parts and then some, uh, some uh, fairly, fairly uh, high agency uh, kinds of uh, manipulators and and uh, and some AI and so on, um, but uh, the reality is, and so and so this is all, all together. This this kind of thing is a really kind of strange, unconventional collective intelligence. But actually, uh, so are we, because it's important to remember that not just ants and termites and beehives and things like this, not just they are collective intelligences, but so are we. In fact, in fact, all intelligence is collective intelligence. There is no such thing as some sort of indivisible unified diamond of intelligence that doesn't have any parts. In fact, um, uh, you know, Rene Descartes was, was really interested in, in, in where in the brain uh, one could uh, sort of attach this, this unified kind of intelligence that, that we feel, the, the, the unified experience of, of humans. And he really liked the pineal gland because he said that there was only one of them in the brain, right? So that, that fit this idea that there should be one place where the unified um, cognition of the human uh, resides. But if he had access to good microscopy, what he what he would have seen is that there isn't one of anything. And in, inside that pineal gland is this. So uh, lots and lots of little cells. And he, inside each one of those cells is this stuff. Look at this. The, look at this amazing structure. All all of this is what works together to result in the uh, competencies of single cells. And all of them together, in the, for example, in the brain, but also in the body, uh, working together result in emergent competencies and cognitive systems of higher um, types of uh, creatures. Now, uh, this is, uh, so, so we are all made of cells. We all take this amazing journey across the Cartesian cut, starting off as just physics, a little pile of uh, chemicals in an unfertilized oocyte. And then slowly and gradually through this process of embryonic development, we become something like this, or maybe even something like that. 
Uh, and, and this is really key. This process is very slow and gradual. There is no specific special point in, uh, in embryonic development where you go from physics to, to mind. It's all kind of a gradual thing. And this is what our components are made of. Now, uh, this, is, this happens to be a free-living cell, but all of our cells used to be free-living organisms at one point. Um, this is called the lacrimaria. Uh, notice a few things. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. Um, the control over the morphology, this is real time. The control over morphology is unbelievable. If you're into soft body robotics, you should be drooling right now. We, you know, this is, this is an incredible level of, of control. All of it is handled in one cell. So all of its local uh, physiological, um, anatomical, and, and uh, metabolic needs are handled here at the level of, of a single cell as it uh, feeds in its, uh, in its environment. If you, if you cut off this little, uh, this little portion of the cell, this head, it will simply, simply reform. Um, and so what we have in biology is this idea that we are not just structurally nested, that is made of organs, tissue, cells, and molecular networks, but actually each of these layers is, uh, is, is competent to solve various problems in its own space. So this is a multi-scale competency architecture. The molecular networks, um, uh, the, so the cellular networks, the, the, the organs, the whole, whole bodies, uh, and, and swarms all solve problems in various spaces, the space of uh, mor mor morphogenesis, a transcriptional space, physiological space, and then in our case, uh, linguistic and social spaces as well. And so because all of the parts of the body have their own competencies, their own abilities to solve problems, you can think of, uh, you, you, you can think of um, the brain body kind of um, uh, connection as, as, uh, as an agential prosthetic. The idea is that we, we not only have various um, uh, uh, effectors that we can use in the, in the Andy Clark sense of the expanded mind. And yeah? so, so other, other types of, uh, um, uh, sensors and effectors that, that your, your, your mind can use, but actually these are agential prosthetics. They're, they're ones that have agendas of their own. And so together they form kind of a, a more global integrated high level system. Now that allows some, uh, for some amazing, uh, types of uh, robust problem solving. I'll show you a, a, a few examples. One is this. So this is a tadpole of the same frog that we were talking about before. Here's the mouth, here are the nostrils, here's the brain, the spinal cord, and, and here's the gut. What you'll notice is that there are no eyes here, but there is an eye on its tail. Because what Doug Blackiston did here is to take some cells from the, the uh, early embryo that are going to make eye, remove them from their primary location, so there are no eyes here in the head, and stick them in the, in the tail. Not only do they uh, form a perfectly good eye, uh, even though they're in a weird location next to a bunch of muscle instead of uh, being next to the brain where they belong, they put out one optic nerve. That optic nerve comes out and it synapses here. You can see where it ends. It synapses on the spinal cord, does not go all the way up to the brain. But uh, what we found by, by building a machine that uh, automates the training and testing of visual um, learning behavior in these animals, these eyes can see perfectly well. So without any additional evolutionary uh, adjustment, this radically different sensory motor architecture. Now the, the brain for millions of years was used to having visual input from these locations. Now you've got this weird itchy patch of tissue on the back that provides some kind of stimulation onto the spinal cord. How does the animal even know that's visual data? But they do perfectly well in, um, in visual learning um, tasks. So this has, this has many interesting uh, consequences. For example, uh, this kind of uh, robust ability to deal with large scale changes to the structure of the organism Right? The fact that these cells are perfectly happy to build an eye wherever, they will find some interesting place to connect to and so on. Uh, during evolution, this, this massively buffers the negative consequences of mutations, because if your eye happens to be moved somewhere else, no problem, uh, your, your fitness is not zero after that. You, 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 you still have uh, quite, a, quite a degree of behavioral um, success. So this allows evolution to explore positive pleiotropic effects of various mutations, in effect, uh, a kind of creativity. And it also means that um, these kind of, uh, this kind of evolutionary uh, process doesn't need to solve a, a, a huge dimensional micromanagement problem of how to direct every cell. What it actually could search is the, is the, and navigate is the space of hacking signals, signals that get uh, various cells to do various things. And we think that that's a much more tractable um, space. Now, uh, in this case, what we've done is something quite different. We, we in my group, uh, study bioelectrical signaling. So this is uh, voltage-based uh, signals between all cells, not just neurons, but all cells actually um, exchange these electrical signals. And one of the things we've learned is uh, 
a, a kind of bioelectric subroutine call that says build an eye at this location. Uh, we, we can make um, actually many different organs. We can make brains and limbs and, uh, and the hearts and um, inner ear organs and so on. But I'm gonna show you an example of an eye. So what we do is uh, early on in embryogenesis, we inject here a kind of uh, ion channel RNA. So there, there are no electrodes, there's no waves or, or, or fields or anything like that. We inject um, RNA to control the interface that these cells are actually using to communicate with each other, which is voltage across the membrane. And when we put the appropriate potassium channel RNAs, that sets a voltage pattern that causes any cells in the body to make an eye. So in this case, the gut is making this, this eye. Here are all the layers that they have. So retina, optic nerve, everything's fine. So there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, what we see here is the incredible uh, 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 high level control. We, we don't provide all the information needed to make an eye. Eyes are incredibly complex. We provide actually a very simple piece of information that's basically a high level subroutine call that says build an eye here. Everything else is folded uh, in, with, within that and the system takes care of all of it. The size control, the different uh, structures relative to each other and so on. There's a, and, and all of this is, is, is discovered. We, do, we, don't, uh, we didn't program this really. We, uh, uh, the, the system does most of the heavy lifting here. Uh, there, are, there are many remarkable competencies to be discovered in these multi-scale systems. For example, this, this round thing is a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere. Uh, the blue cells are the ones that we actually injected with this ion channel RNA. So the blue cells are the ones that we tell you should make an eye, but there's not enough of them. And so what they do is they actually recruit their neighbors. So all the brown and clear cells were never, in fact, uh, targeted by us at all. But what these cells do is recruit their neighbors to participate in this, uh, in this uh, morphogenetic event because they can tell there's not enough of them to do it by themselves. So this is, this is a, 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 a common property of these kind of um, distributed intelligences like ants and termites and so on. When there's a task to be done, they recruit their, their buddies to, to scale up to the, uh, to, the, to the task at hand. And that's what happened here. It's a, um, uh, there are two levels of instruction. Here's us instructing these cells that there should be an eye here. And then these cells take care of everything else, including uh, uh, redirecting and, uh, and, and, and um, behavior shaping a bunch of their neighbors so that they will go and help and instead of making skin and everything else that belongs in the tail, will help them to make this eye. So these kind of competencies are there to be uh, discovered in these multi-scale systems. Um, I want to uh, show you another example in this, in this animal. This is uh, called a planarian. It's a flatworm. It has a true brain, a central nervous system, lots of different organs, um, quite, quite an interesting uh, creature, fairly complex. And it has a number of remarkable properties. Uh, first of all, it's highly regenerative. So you can cut this guy into pieces. The record is something like 276. Every piece will grow exactly what's needed, no more, no less, and uh, give you a perfect tiny little worm. Because of this regenerability, they are also immortal. There's no such thing as an old planarian. They mm, uh, re regenerate any senescent cells. And so they just continue to, uh, to rebuild themselves if, uh, as far as we can tell forever. Um, they're also very cancer resistant. But all of this takes place uh, in the presence of an extremely messy genome because the way these guys uh, often reproduce is they just tear themselves in half and each side regenerates and now you've got two worms. This means that unlike for the rest of us who do not pass on any mutations that we get in our body, we don't pass them on to our children. Yeah? This, um, uh, uh, in these guys, they keep every mutation that doesn't kill the cell. And in fact, it's propagated into the new body after they regenerate and have to, uh, and have to rebuild larger bodies. And so they accumulate mutations um, and what, what, happens, what happens in these guys is that uh, uh, they've basically uh, perfected the algorithm that uh, they, 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 uh, evolution isn't expecting the, uh, the, the hardware to be robust. It, it, uh, the, the hardware is assumed to be, to be, to be um, highly variable and faulty. Every, every cell in these guys can have a different number of chromosomes. They're mixoploid. So you really can't count on the hardware very much. What you have to have is an algorithm that builds a perfect worm no matter what's underneath. And that's why... Uh, they are resistant to, to disorders of aging, of cancer, um, in fact, of transgenesis. They don't even have transgenic planaria or lines of mutant worms uh, that don't exist because these guys will build a perfect worm under a huge range of, uh, uh, of you know, various conditions. Um, but one thing you can do is you can target that morphogenetic machinery. In fact, how do they know how many heads, how many tails they're supposed to have? If all of this is happening, all this unreliable hardware is underneath, how do they remember what's going on here? So we studied this process and we're able to uh, track using voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes, 
uh, we were able to do a kind of uh, imaging. It's a sort of akin to neural decoding, except it's not for neurons, it's for the rest of the body. We're interested in decoding the memories of the collective intelligence that makes up this morphogenetic process of, of re rebuilding and, and so on. And so what we found is that there's a voltage pattern that literally tells the animal how many heads to have. This is the wild type pattern that says one head, one tail. And so when you cut an animal, when you cut an animal like this, uh, in fact, you get one head, one tail. What we were able to do is to take this animal, perfectly normal one-headed worm, with a gene expression just like the normal one, meaning the anterior genes are on in the head, they're off in the tail. And what we've been able to do is uh, using uh, ion channel targeting drugs is to rewrite this pattern so that instead of one head, it says two heads. It's actually kind of messy, but the technology is still being worked out. And so <clears throat> what you have here is this idea that a single planarian body can store at least, probably much more, but at least one of two different representations of what a correct planarian will look like. That representation is used as the set point of a homeostatic uh, remodeling process so that when you do cut this animal, this is what it builds. Again, not Photoshop, these are real um, two-headed animals. Um, again, this bioelectric pattern is a map of this one-headed body, not of this one. So it's actually even a counterfactual memory. It doesn't do anything until you go, until you cut off the head and the tail. And then that information is used to drive morphogenesis. So we, so we now, much like neuroscientists, are able to um, do some neural decoding and uh, try to uh, understand what the electrical patterns in the in the in a living brain entail about the memories, the preferences, the the goal states, and so on of the of the human or uh, animal subject. We can do this to the, with the collective intelligence of the body, read out the pattern memories, understand what it's going to build if it gets injured, and in fact rewrite them. And so when you do rewrite them, the reason I call this um, a pattern memory is because once you do this, if we change it to a two-headed state, that, uh, that electric circuit that sets up that pattern actually um, has a memory to it. When you change it, it holds. And so these two-headed animals, if you keep cutting them, keep cutting off the heads, they will continue to rebuild as two-headed forever. Uh, here's, what, uh, here's, here's what they look like, these two-headed animals you can see. So this has all the properties of, of memory. It's long-term stable, it's rewritable, it has conditional recall, I just showed you that, and it has two uh, discrete possible um, behaviors. Now notice that uh, in planaria, there are no uh, mutant lines, there are no um, uh, transgenic worms, people have been trying for many decades. Uh, when you change the genetics, nothing happens because these, these animals are already built. The algorithm assumes that the, that the structural genome is unreliable. But what you can do is you can produce permanent lines of aberrant two-headed worms. So this is a permanent line, but it's not genetic. It's done by rewriting at the software level. Okay. Now, not only can we make worms with the wrong number of heads, we can make worms with the wrong species shape of head. So you can take this triangular uh, kind of uh, species, Dugesia doradocephala, cut off, uh, cut off the head. Uh, uh, treat treat them with a drug that uh, confuses the bioelectrical circuit, and as a result, they will make flat heads like this P. felina, round heads like this S. mediterranea, or of course they're normal heads. Um, not only the shape of the head, but actually the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells becomes just like these other species, about 100 to 150 million years of evolutionary distance. So what you see is that the exact same hardware can visit attractors in this anatomical morphous space that normally belongs to other species. Normally, these other this this other genetically specified hardware is what lives there. But you can you can you can uh, prompt these the, this the, this um, group of cells to visit them as well if the appropriate information is there in the uh, physiological control circuits. So head shape, head number. Um, you can go well beyond that, and uh, uh, actually we can make we can make planaria with shapes that uh, don't look like flatworms at all. You can explore really diverse regions of this latent morphous space. So you can make these spiky worms, you can make this uh, kind of uh, cylindrical thing, and, and you can make these, these hybrid forms. So again, the idea is that you can get cells to visit really, uh, really far regions of that, of that anatomical morphous space, given the right set of signals. Um, uh, and, and by the way, the DNA here, in all of these examples, there's, there's nothing uh, altered about the hardware. The DNA is exactly the same. We haven't changed it. Uh, similar to here, the, the, this, uh, the DNA in these guys is, is exactly the same as in the rest of the leaf. Um, if, if anybody, I mean, the, the next the slide is a little, a little gory. Um, it's, a, it's a surgery, a picture of a surgery. If you're a squeamish, you might want to uh, uh, not look at the, at the next slide. Um, 
I want to talk about this idea of 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 hacking and and how we and how other creatures manipulate each other as part of this relationship. And so this is uh, this is an example of a surgery where you can see, you know, um, people talk about all the time whether whether living things are machines or not. I mean, there are a number of approaches. This is a very machine like approach. This is something here here's what it ends up um what it ends up being in the surgery. There's there's an integration of of living material and and a very kind of low agency passive material. And all it does is hold its hold its shape. But um this is of course not the only uh, game in town as far as manipulating uh living living matter because after we do this uh we rely on the body to quote unquote heal. All of the things that happen after this are things that we really don't have much control over. In fact in, in molecular medicine, really the only successful uh, interventions, permanent interventions, are things that work against the low agency invaders uh, of the body, such as microbes, cancer, um, things like that. So antibiotics, um, um, uh, kind of uh, chemotherapy, those things work well. But actually, uh, in, in biomedicine, we have very few things that treat the body itself in a permanent way, being able to fix it, not, not just target symptoms, but actually fix it in a permanent way. There are, there are very few things that, that actually do that. And that's because we are still groping for ways to interact with truly agential materials, which living bodies are. So, so we've been engineering with passive materials for uh, thousands of years. And now we're coming into some active materials and even active matter and some computational materials. But uh, bodies are all the way to the right of this kind of a uh, continuum of, uh, I, I call it an axis of persuadability as far as different types of technologies that you need to optimally relate to these different different systems. Even molecular networks have six different kinds of learning that um, that they can do. And so, uh, you know, all, all up and down this this kind of uh, uh, scale of, of different uh, different levels of sophistication by, uh, by, by uh, Wiener et al. Um, we start to find different ways to relate to these systems to try to change uh, their their function. Uh, individual cells here. These are um, these. This is uh, the, these are, these are the individual cells of which xenobots are made. So you can see here this little uh, you know we call it the little the little uh, tiny horse here. Uh, this is these are all of these are just just loose skin cells, and you can see they they move as a as a collective. There's all kinds of interesting behaviors. The the, the lightning flash, by the way, is is calcium um, that you're going to see. This calcium signaling when it when it connects. So cells have individual behaviors. They have collective behaviors on a scale much smaller than even a xenobots. At a larger scale, again, here's our planarian. Um, one of the things that uh, you don't see in this planarian is the pharynx. The pharynx is this muscular tube that it uses to pick up food. And the pharynx is normally not seen. It's sitting uh, quietly, um, uh, passively inside the animal. But much like with the xenobot, where we released the skin cells from the uh, instructive influence of the other cells, when you remove the pharynx from the rest of the body, um, here is what happens. These are, these are individual pharynxes. They're actually very active. They have a life of their own. This 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 one is going to try to eat. This is liver. This is going to try to eat a piece of liver. Of course, it's just a tube, so so it comes. So the liver comes out the other end. So all it all it ends up doing is burrowing uh, burrowing through. But they have their own independent life, and they and they live for quite quite some time, if very differently than what they do inside. And 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 Wilhelm Ruh called it the struggle of the parts uh, back in the early days of developmental biology. The idea that uh, because we are multi scale competent uh, systems. All the parts have to be controlling each other all the time in order for this uh, for the for our emergent uh, selves to appear. And so, when we think about um, when we, we go going back to this to this idea of xenobots, when we think about what 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 did evolution actually learn in producing the Xenopus lavis frog? So here's the genome. Most of the time, what it does is this: it makes uh, these embryos with a standard developmental sequence. They end up being tadpoles with a standard set of behaviors and if 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 one just looks at the natural course of things, this is what you think evolution has learned. It has evolved a frog, which is a solution to a, a kind of a froggy environment as a as a problem, and it's it's highly highly adaptive, very fit, uh, very nice. But it turns out that um, in a different scenario, these exact same cells with this exact same genome can make a xenobot. These xenobots have different shapes. They have different developmental sequence. So this is uh, uh, you know about a month. Uh, this is a xenobot about a month old. It's turned from this into something like this. Um, and then, and and they have a completely different set of uh, set of behaviors. So, with this 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 provides us with an interesting challenge. Um, the uh, it, it, typically, when when you ask for for any given animal, when you ask where does its 
uh, shape and behavior come from? The answer is well, evolutionary selection. And for for eons, it's been it's been sculpted by uh, by by evolutionary forces and, and selection to be to have certain properties. But there's never been any xenobots. There's never been any selection to be a good xenobot. All of this is completely emergent. So the cells, of course, uh, evolved in the frog lineage, but the the evolutionary pressures on them were, were completely different. So everything, including this kinematic self replication, this idea of the ability to make copies of themselves when all of the normal frog uh, kind of uh, reproductive uh, machinery is removed. This is just skin. They don't have the ability to reproduce the normal way. They come up with a different way that's, to our knowledge, never existed in evolution before. So uh, what's happening here is a kind of um, really engineering by subtraction. What we did was we removed the other cells that normally basically bully these skin cells into having a boring two-dimensional life on the surface of the animal. In the absence of those signals, you get to see what the cells really want to do, which is this is the default behavior of those cells when they're not being hacked and influenced by their neighbors. This is what they're actually going to do. And uh, and it's and, and all of these competencies are incredibly non-obvious, and they allow us to have these model systems with which we can start to develop a science of predicting the the goals, the behavioral repertoire, and so on of complex multi-scale systems uh, from knowing the properties of the parts, which we still really don't know very well. So I'm going to um, just to just to kind of summarize what we have here, and this is this is a sort of obvious homage to uh, to Doug Hofstadter's um, classic book, the idea that what you have in the Xenopus uh, genome uh, is the ability to, uh, under various circumstances, to produce different kinds of uh, creatures. And in fact, we don't know what else what else it's capable of doing. This hardware, I, I, I want to float the idea that a biological evolution doesn't just produce solutions to specific problems, but it actually makes problem-solving machines. It makes uh, very versatile hardware that can solve problems in multiple spaces and has different uh, so very surprising behavior and, and that and that actually collaboration with AI and with human scientists is what's uh, allowing us to start to catch a glimpse of, of what else is possible. So uh, the main the main points that uh, I try to transmit today are that uh, all biological life is a kind of collective intelligence of multi-scale competent agents. Um, and uh, the implications of this, and this is uh, I call this the TAME framework, T-A-M-E, for technological approach to mind everywhere. Um, has has many applications from regenerative medicine to understanding evolution to novel robotics and AI to really start to uh, take on board the deep lessons of biology um, in terms of uh, how the how the, the the hardware and the software relate to each other and how they implement uh, novel ab ability to solve novel problems and that these biological robots are really an exploration tool they're um, a kind of uh, de device really that we can use to explore new spaces, to explore morphous space, uh, to find these unexpected capabilities. And that it's really now on us to learn to recognize, predict, control, understand, uh, participate in, because I think for example, um, uh, uh, Josh and, uh, and uh, Doug and, uh, and Sam and I were, are actually part of this, this novel Xenobot uh, creation mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to create and to ethically relate to radically different composite beings. And um, I'm, I, I also think that uh, when, when Darwin had this uh, famous phrase, endless forms most beautiful, you know, he was kind of really impressed at the wide variety of living forms that he saw. Everything that he saw, that end of one example of the tree of life on earth is a tiny corner of this massive option space of a possible beings, possible bodies and possible minds. Because because biology is so highly interoperable, because biological systems will find a coherent way to exist, even when uh, mixed at every level with foreign DNA and nanomaterials. And so every combination of evolved material, designed material, and software is some kind of plausible agent. So we have cyborgs and hybrids and chimeras and, and um, uh, all kinds of uh, hybrids. Uh, many of these already exist. They will increasingly exist. And this has huge implications for, for ethics because uh, the old way of figuring out how you're going to relate to something, which is where did it come from? Meaning, was it evolved or designed? And what does it look like? What's inside? Is it a human brain? Is it is it soft and squishy? Is it made of metal? Those those kinds of criteria are uh, basic. I mean, they were never any good really, but but they served okay uh, in prior um, ages. They're they're not going to survive the next couple of decades. It's a, it's all it's a, it's a completely different uh, game looking into the future, where we're going to have to find ways to relate to beings that are nowhere on the tree of life relative to us, 
and that are completely different in terms of their um, their provenance and their structure and behavior. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to relate to them. So I'll stop um, here and just um, say that uh, all of this, uh, if you want to um, see more, there are there are a couple of interesting uh, papers here. Um, this this one with Josh, uh, some stuff on on machines, some stuff on uh, engineering with agential materials. And so I want to thank um, the people who did all the work. So this is the um, uh, the Zenabot team, Doug Blackiston, Sam Kriegman, and Josh Bongard. Um, I have to do a disclosure because uh, Fauna Systems is a spin-off company uh, that uh, was formed around the whole uh, Zenabot technology. Um, uh, Pai and, and Sherry did the uh, the eye work that I showed you. This is our uh, was our worm worm team and uh, our various collaborators, um, our funders. Uh, Jeremy Gay did all the um, amazing uh, diagrams. And uh, always uh, the animals, they do all the heavy lifting. They, they uh, teach us um, everything of, of importance. So um, yeah, thank you for listening and I'll take questions.